Okay, dealing with divorce, difficult questions, biblical answers, lesson number four, the title of this class, The Marriage Bed. And uh, you can open your Bibles to Hebrews. We'll look at uh, a passage there in a, a couple of minutes. I want to uh, quote some uh, statistics to begin with. According to the National Center for Health Statistics here in the United States, the number of live births to single mothers in 2015, the last year stats were available, 1,604,870 children born to single mothers in the United States. But the eye-popping figure is the percentage. In this country, 40% of all children are born to single mothers. 40%, I mean, we, we, we could kind of you know, drill down just on that statistic and the impact that that's, you know, that statistic has on our, on our country. Uh, it seems that, uh, and, and the thing is, I was looking at the stats you know, throughout the years, it seems that this group, it grows larger year by year as families you know, break up, as parents abandon their marriages, as children are born to parents who are not married, and they don't intend to be married. They don't intend to be married either. Uh, so there are less fathers and mothers caring for their own children, even though children continue to be born, because more and more people don't know or they don't care about God's commands concerning sex. And of course we know sex eventually, whether you like it or not, whether you're planning to or not, leads to babies. And what do you do with all those babies? No. This is, just the, this is just the number of births. We're not quoting the number of abortions you know, to single mothers. So it's, it's quite a problem. A lot of passages in the Bible dealing with sex, but one verse summarizes well God's will for all sexual activities, just to kind of you know, encapsulate it. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse four. The writer says, marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So I want you to note the instructions, just a few, a few lines, right? But note the instructions. First of all, marriage is to be held in honor among all. Uh, and when they talk about marriage in the Bible, obviously they're talking about God's view of marriage. One man, one woman for life. This is to be respected, not just by Christians, but by everyone. This means that laws established to permit homosexuals to marry or lesbians to marry, this is wrong in God's eyes because the Bible said everyone should respect to honor uh, marriage, and as I said in the Bible, uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. This means also that parents are to accept and respect their children's marriage and not manipulate to change or hurt it. It, all, it also means this, the marriage should be honored by everybody. That means parents need to honor their children's marriage as well. This means that the marriage bond is not to be broken or attacked by outsiders. This means that we're to respect the vows within marriage. So marriage is something God has created for mankind and this institution should be protected and respected by everyone. So that's one of the instructions that this passage uh, underscores. Another, inspection, uh, um, another uh, instruction, uh, he says the marriage bed is not to be defiled. The marriage bed of course refers to the intimacy of the couple which includes obviously their sexual relationship. The Bible says this relationship should not be defiled. This is God's command, not, not just a good idea. It would be nice if God commands this. Now the author mentions two ways that this relationship is defiled. And the, the, the word defiled here refers to to be made dirty, to be made unclean, to be made impure. The first that he mentions is fornicate. You shouldn't defile the marriage bed with fornication. Now the Greek word translated into the English word fornicate means someone who indulges in illicit sex. That's the simple meaning of the word. This is, uh, this is sexual activity outside of marriage. 
So you know, the Bible is so concise, you know, one word covers so much. Sexual activity outside of marriage. It includes homosexuality, pornography, heterosexual activity before one is married. All right. It doesn't mean healthy and sincere demonstration of affection in marriage. It refers to sexual activity outside of marriage, arousal, stimulation, sex, things that are not permitted by God outside of marriage. Now it's interesting to note that the writer says that fornication or sex outside of marriage spoils or defiles sex within the marriage. Remember he says Whoa, what defiles the marriage bed is sex outside of the marriage bed. You know, 2,000 years later, you know, after this is written, psychologists tell us that much of the dysfunctional sex in marriage can be traced to sexual activity that has happened before the marriage has taken place. So that, that's not the Bible, that's just you know, research. God has always forbidden sex before marriage and with good reason. Sex before marriage causes all kinds of problems, jealousy, comparisons, shame, guilt, anger, disease, and of course, unwanted pregnancies. These are all results of sex before marriage. These are all good reasons to remain pure and keep, marriage, keep the marriage bed undefiled. It's not just an old fashioned thing to teach our children to be sexually pure. You know, oh, it's an old fashioned, no, no. This is God's way to preserve something very special that He's given to all of us. Those who are not married yet should realize that entering into marriage with a sexual history brings that sexual history into the marriage. And as the writer says, defiles that marriage bed. Second thing that the author mentions is adultery. Adultery defiles the marriage bed. So the definition of adultery. Adultery is when a married person has sex with a person other than their spouse. Nothing kills a marriage faster than unfaithfulness. So much so that Jesus gave this as an exception to the rules on divorce in Matthew 9, 9, except for fornication, he says, except for adultery. So when I counsel people, people who have done this give reasons why they cheated. You know, I'm, when I'm counseling with the, quote, the guilty party, all kinds of, well, it just happened. <laughs> you know, spontaneous combustion. Uh, the one I like is, I didn't mean for it to happen. Or I love this other woman, or I love this other man, or my wife or my husband, you know, they don't understand me. You know, I've, I've heard all of those things. Of course, these are just excuses to cover the real reason for the adultery. They didn't pay enough attention to their spouse, <laughs> usually is the number one reason. Or they allowed themselves to get too close to some other person. Falling in love with somebody is, you, know, you can be in love with someone else other than your spouse, but it doesn't happen in 20 minutes. <laughs> it takes time. You have to cultivate that thing. Or they didn't deal with their lust right away, thinking, oh, I can handle it. The new girl in the office, man, she looks mighty fine. That's the first thought. Wow, she, she looks even better today than she did yesterday. Maybe we should have coffee together. I like to get to know her a little. You know, your, your, your conscience is throwing up a red, ding, 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 ding. No, 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 don't do that. And then the self-talk is, I can handle it. I'm in control of myself. Well, that person is the one that says, I didn't mean for it to happen. Well, you shouldn't have gone for coffee with someone you actually felt attracted to that wasn't your spouse. Whatever the reason or failing, adultery destroys the marriage bed and very few marriages survive it. Some do. I've, I've, I've actually counseled with people where they have survived this thing, but very, very few. As a matter of fact, Few marriages that are a result of adultery are healthy because many times they're built on, you know, they're built on a failed uh, marriage. Some do, but it's pretty hard. Uh, he goes on to talk about the consequences of defiling the marriage bed. So the Hebrew writer not only establishes the institution of marriage as holy and uh, lists the thing that defiles it, he also warns of the consequences. He says, for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. 
Note that both fornicators and adulterers will be judged. Interesting because our society today makes a distinction between these two sins. A very interesting development. Adultery, cheating on your spouse, that is still wrong. If you were to take a survey, you know, 99, I'm sure 90% of the you know, respondents would say, oh no, that's wrong. Even, even in gay marriage, you know, two men, two women being married, even they will say, no, that's wrong. You know, he cheated on me. You know, that's, they still see being unfaithful in marriage is wrong. Fornication, however, is okay as long as it is consensual and that you are careful not to get any disease or get pregnant. So having sex before marriage, that's okay. Living together before, it, uh, before marriage, that's okay. We tolerate homosexuality and lower our standards on books and movies. And what's the cause? Well, society says, you know, this is fine, this is okay, nothing wrong with this. Amazing how the Bible says both of these things are wrong and society says, well, one is wrong and one is okay. Now I have a question here for us to consider. Since when has social custom replaced God's word? It was custom, for example, for the Canaanites to sacrifice their babies to Molech. Did that make it okay? It was custom for the Greeks to enjoy pedophilia, you know, sex with children. That was custom. But did this make it okay? It was custom for the South in our own country to own and trade slaves several hundred years ago. It was custom. But did that make it okay? It is now custom to have sex before marriage, to live together before marriage, to have children without being married. But does this make it okay just because it is custom? Because it is convenient? Because everything, everybody does it in our society? Really? As Christians, you know, we have to make up our minds here once and for all. Is our conduct, especially our sexual conduct, going to be guided by custom, by what others do, by what we feel like, or is it going to be guided by God's word? You know, society says that sex between any two free consenting adults is okay and is nobody's business. That's the other part. Nobody's business who I sleep with. The Bible, on the other hand, says, let the marriage bed be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers will be judged. So you, know, you need to make up your mind here, which way you're going to go. Not only is there a directive as to when sex should take place in marriage, there's also a warning that those who violate this command will be judged and punished. I chose this passage to talk about this topic in our series because it is so concise. It covers all types of sex. It differentiates between what is permissible and what is not. And it also describes the punishment. I mean, there isn't another passage in the Bible that is so clear and so comprehensive about this. And I mention this in case you are speaking to your children and you're training your people or you're discussing this, if you can't remember all the passages you know, about sexual activity in the Bible, remember, her, uh, remember Hebrews 13.4. If you just remember Hebrews 13.4, it covers everything. You know, one passage uh, fits all arguments, if you wish. Now, the Hebrew writer doesn't give the details of what the punishment will be here you have to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Paul says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. Uh, he continues, uh, nor, uh, let's see, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. For our purpose, I just read the the beginning of that passage. So as Christians, we understand that those who refuse Christ and do not obey His gospel, they won't be saved. You know, those who believe and are baptized, they're going to be saved. Those who disbelieve will not be saved, Mark 16, 16. But Paul here warns that even Christians who revert back to unchristian behavior, they'll also be condemned. You know, Christians in the first century were sorely tempted to be sexually impure. You think we live? <laughs> you think we live in a you know, society that's 
you know, sexually corrupt, wow. They lived in a wicked and sexually depraved society. Many of them came from pagan backgrounds where sex was used in their religious rituals, imagine. And because most were slaves at the time, the early church, most of them were slaves, they were subject to sexual advances of their masters or to use sex in order to gain favor. That's the only bargaining thing they had. So they came from a very, very uh, you know, wicked society as far as sex is concerned. Today, of course, we live in a different society, but the temptation to be sexually impure is just as great. We don't live in a, uh, a depraved society. We live in a saturated society. I mean, sex saturates our society. Everything is sold with sex. You can't, you can't, even, read the, you can't even read the local paper without you know, images of uh, you know, scantily clad women selling something. So we live in a, you know, it's, it's just everywhere. Uh, you, know, you know, those of you, you, know, you use the internet, you have to be careful what you type in. You know, if you're looking for information, you have to be careful because there are certain words you know, that'll get you into uh, pornography sites. You know, there's uh, several million sites that just uh, you know, uh, provide pornography. Um, uh, the level of sexual morality in our society is low. There are very little encouragement by leaders to be pure sexually. Churches are lax in speaking against impure sexual practices that are going on. You know, when was the last time we ever disciplined someone for adultery in this church or fornication? So we, we need to be careful. Let's not make a mistake. God's word means the same now as it did then. He said He will punish fornicators and adulterers. So you know, we need to take Take that warning seriously. All right, so enough of the, on, on the negative side. How do we keep the marriage bed undefiled? Well, remaining sexually pure or regaining sexual purity is difficult, but not impossible. So as I close out the lesson on this particular topic, I want to give you some ways to make your marriage bed holy and acceptable to God and totally undefiled for you and your partner. So, how to keep the marriage bed undefiled. Number one, commit yourself to personal purity. I'll say it again. Commit yourself to personal sexual purity. Let's not make this just an idea that's out there. Oh yeah, sexual purity, yeah, that's a good thing. Make that a personal, a personal goal. Impurity, sexual uncleanness, fornication, adultery, all these things happen gradually in our lives as we lower our standards, as we develop bad habits and friends, as we consume improper sexual material. So the first step is a commitment that what you think and what you dwell on in your heart, what you say and do, what you allow others to do, will be pure sexually and acceptable to God on His terms, not your terms. This means you commit yourself to the boundaries that God has established concerning sex. God has established boundaries concerning sex. Why? Because it's so powerful. That's why. You know, if you just buy licorice, right? you go to the store and you buy the, you know, the long twist, you know, licorice. Are there any warning labels on licorice? <laughs> Other than the amount of sugar in them, there are no handle with care. You, know, you can do what you want with licorice. Eat it all at once, throw it around, throw it at people. You, know, you can do what you want with licorice. But if you buy a box of dynamite, whoa, there are warnings, all kinds of warnings on a box of dynamite. Why? Because it's so powerful. It could be so destructive. It could be so constructive we would not have been able to build the roads and highways and so on, you know, without dynamite. But you have to be careful how you use it because you could blow yourself up, right? Well, sex is the same. Sex is the same thing. It's dynamite. It, 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 can, it, can, it can build a marriage. It can provide pleasure. It can uh, create intimacy. It can do wonderful things. But it's dangerous if you do not handle it carefully. So I go back. It means that you commit yourself to the boundaries that God has established concerning sex, the warning labels. Okay? Um, 
This means that impure thoughts, when they come, they float through your mind and they don't become permanent guests. This means that if you're not married, you don't engage in sex with, an, with the other, whether it's foreplay or intercourse. This means that if you're married, your total sexual experience is found in your spouse, no one else, real or imaginary. It's amazing that the Bible doesn't give any instruction on what to do when you have sex with your marriage partner. There are no instructions. You can do this, but you can't do that. You know, you, you know, missionary style is the only way permit. No, there are no instructions. I think God figured we'd get it. We'd figure it out. We'd figure out how to please one another. The only instructions are warnings on what not to do. And most of the warnings on what not to do is usually involves some type of sexual activity with someone other than your spouse. I get a lot of you know, people when they come in for counseling, especially when it comes to sexual activity, if they've grown up in the church, for some reason or other they think that you know, they've, they've, they've um, worked very hard on being sexually pure. And so they think that that having sex when they get married, somehow there's something wrong with that. There's all this residual guilt going on. That's why I say God doesn't give us any instructions for what to do within, within marriage. No, there's no reason for any guilt for people having sex within the boundaries of marriage. This also means that your uh, total sexual experience focused on your spouse. Yes, I think I mentioned that. This means that even if you're engaged or in love, again, you wait until you're married before living together or having sex. Sounds so you know, old fashioned. You know, some, people, some people think that getting married or engaged erases the fornication that takes place before marriage. You know, they, they, they've had sex all summer and then they decide to get married and then, okay, that takes care of that. I need to remind them that the only thing that removes sin is repentance and baptism for the non-Christian or repentance and prayer for the Christian. You know, Christian parents and young people, please, you know, I tell them, don't ask me to perform your wedding if you choose to have sex or live together and refuse to repent of this. I have that conversation with people who uh, come to see me to be married. You know, we talk, you know, why do you want to get married? How long have you been going out together? So on and so forth. And if they're serious about getting married, I ask the question, are you people living together? And if the answer is no, no, well, we still live with our parents. Are you people sleeping together? Wow, he's getting awfully personal. Because <laughs> if you are, stop. Stop. Repent of that. Do what's right. You're going to get married, there'll be a whole lifetime of intimacy. So getting married, you know, it's a good thing. And setting a better course than just living together or having casual sex, but it doesn't deal with the sexual sin that comes before it. As Christians, we need to deal with our sins, whatever they are. What does John say? John 1, uh, 1 John 1, 8, 9, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. People who live together have sex before marriage and then they get married thinking that takes care of everything. Those are the people deceiving themselves. There doesn't need to be, a, you know, I tell them, there doesn't need to be a big ceremony about it. You don't have to come up front you know, and say, well, we did this wrong. No. I just alert them to the fact that you see what you were doing? I know you love each other, but this is not God's way. And if you're getting married and you want me to perform the ceremony, it means that you want God to bless what you're doing because I'm a minister and I will offer the prayer of blessing. But if you want that prayer of blessing from God, then you need to take care of this other business here with God as well. Okay. So as I say, when young people come to me to be married, you know, I, I ask those questions. Be prepared to answer those questions because I want the marriage bed to be undefiled when you enter into it. All right, to keep the marriage bed undefiled also, seek a like mate. Commit yourself to personal purity, of course. Seek a like mate. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, Paul says not to be yoked or teamed up with 
unbelievers. And he lists several reasons, but all of them point to the same idea. They're not, they're not the same as we are, especially when it comes to the marriage bed. Two Christians who are committed to personal purity will have a better chance of maintaining sexual control and a faithful marriage bed than a mixed couple where the unbeliever uses society's standard for sexual conduct. Imagine if it's a he, let's say he's the unbeliever. The, the, the male unbeliever, his standard for sexual conduct is the world standard and his wife's standard for sexual conduct is the Bible. Do you see a potential problem here? Maybe not on the wedding day and as things go on, but as time goes on, as the bonds of marriage are tested with time and trial, you think there might be a problem? Marriage you know, does not transform a fornicator or an adulterer. They just bring these sins into the marriage bed with them. But that's very hard to explain to a 22 year old girl who's you know, after their meeting with me is going to go get her wedding dress. That kind of information you know, is, is hard to communicate. Number three, ask for forgiveness. Now I realize that for many the lesson, this lesson here, comes after the fact. If you're single, maybe you've already lost your virginity. Some are into second or third marriages. And there are those you know, who have cheated, had children out of marriage, lived together before marriage, and the list of sexual sins just goes on and on and on. So you may be asking, well, how do I commit to personal purity? How do I do that? How do I purify my marriage? This is my third marriage. You know, what do I do? I'm so far down the road here. Well, thankfully, we have a God who is not only merciful, but who can make straight what is crooked, who can make whole what is broken, who can make pure what has been defiled by sin. I love 1 Corinthians 6.11, Paul in talking about fornicators and adulterers and other sinners says the following. He says, such were some of you, but, I love that but, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. What a wonderful and encouraging passage. What we cannot do with any amount of trying God can do through His mercy. You know, we can go back and fix the ruined marriage or two in our past. We, we can't fix those things. We, we can't take back the sexual activity, the sinful sexual activity that we have been involved in in the past. We can't take it back. We can't change it. It's done. But God can fix these things. You know, for those who have managed to keep themselves sexually pure, he can help maintain that state and guide that person to a marriage bed that will be joyful and undefiled. And you know, isn't that what we wish for? No matter what we've done in our life, no matter what our experience has been, uh, uh, don't we want something good for our children? It reminds me, I, I was at the Walmart the other day and I was just getting some things and there next to me was a, a, a man, a young man, you know, in his 30s I guess, and he was all tatted up, you know, tattoos up and down, he had a ring nose and he had his hat backwards and he had tattoos up his neck and you know, he was, yeah. And he had by the hand a little boy just you know, a little toddler, could walk, but you know, he was holding him by the hand. And if I closed my eyes, he sounded like every other dad that I've ever heard. No, it, no, no, you can't have that. You can't have that candy. Uh, you know, it's, we're going home, we're going to have lunch. No, you have a toy like that. Be careful now, stick close to daddy. Hold my hand. No, no, you can't walk. No, we're going in the parking lot. So you stick close to dad. He sounded like every other father I've ever heard. He was, he was caring for his little boy. And yet, if you open your eyes, he looked like he was part of a, a gang or something, right? Looks can be deceiving. But I have a feeling that that father would not allow his little boy to sit and watch pornography. He would say, oh, hey, turn that off, come on. It, you know, don't show that to the boy. You know, instinctively, we want to protect our, our children. We know instinctively what is right, what is good. 
We, you know, I doubt there are very many mothers there that sit their, their 16 or 17 year old daughters down and say to them, now here's my advice to you, get out there and sleep with as many people as you can. You know, try everything, go for it. Don't worry about it, it'll be great. I, I doubt there are many mothers that ever counsel that to their daughters. We know what's right, we know what's good. And of course, God knows it as well. So for those who have sinned, who have failed, who have spoiled what was meant to be clean and holy, God can restore to a pure status through the blood of Christ and it's accessed by the non-Christian through repentance and baptism, but it's also accessed by the Christian through confession and prayer for forgiveness. There's no ceremony to purify our marriage bed if in some way we have made it impure. There's no ceremony for that. It's, it's, it's uh, not a ceremony, it's a prayer. God, this thing here, I recognize this has not been pure, it has not been what you have wanted. And I ask you to forgive me for it. And from here on in, I'm going to make a, an effort to be pleasing in your sight, to do what is right in your sight. That's the good news of Christianity. All of us can go before God with our messy mistakes and ask for forgiveness and be absolutely sure that He gives us forgiveness and then we can go on. So for the virgin girl, 23 years old, going into marriage with her virgin boyfriend, you know, and, and they're going to get married and the first time they will have sex will be on their honeymoon, amen, good for them, praise God. They've managed to do it the way it ought to be done. And let's hope they'll maintain that union you know, for the rest of their lives. And for those who have had, let's just say, a checkered past, a less than perfect situation as they entered marriage and they finally kind of getting it right and then they, they became a Christian nine years after they were married and uh, nine years after they were married the second time. You know, for that person, yeah, there's, there's that imperfect past there. That person, after their prayer requesting forgiveness and the blood of Jesus cleanses them their marriage bed is pure, just like the marriage bed of that young couple that I talked about before. That's the good news of Christ. That's the good news. That's why people flock to Him. That's why people come to Him. Those are the reasons why uh, people give up their lives and, and put on Christ. He erases the past. He makes the crooked way straight. He makes what was impure, pure and good. He gives us encouragement to go on with courage. His forgiveness cleanses sexual sins, purifies the conscience, and makes holy the marriage bed that has been previously defiled by sin. All right, so that's our lesson on that for this time. Next time we're going to be talking about domestic violence. Uh, I have two parts, two part lesson on that. Very interesting, a lot of good statistics and information. Thank you very much for your attention.